uh, the Runjui people of the Eastern Kulin Nations, on whose the, as the traditional owners on the land of which the University of RMIT stands. RMIT University respectfully recognizes elders both past and present and future. Um, I also like to acknowledge the owners of the land of the traditional homelands of, of where I'm uh, at, the, at in the moment uh, in Reno, Nevada, the Numu, uh, the Washo, and the uh, Nui, and the Nuu uh, peoples um, uh, who traditionally own the lands here in Reno, Nevada. So with that, uh, we have Tommy Cruiser today uh, talking about deep paving paradise, um, the vast potential of par car park conversion. Tommy's an urban planner and spatial analysis working with the Icon Science program with a specialist interest in urban greening. Um, he's also worked uh, for uh, City Melbourne and delivered green projects and policy in uh, some of those very urbanized spaces within the city CBD. And Tommy, I'm going to let you take it away here, okay? Thanks very much for that, Matthew. I'll just get my screen shared. Um, while I do that, I should acknowledge as well that I'm speaking to you from sovereign, unceded Wurundjeri land here in Carlton. Um, and of course, now it's difficult. Device, apps. There we are, share. And okay, how's that? All good, buddy. All good. All right. So, um, I'm going to show you a bit of research that I'm currently finalizing. Um, it's really about converting parking into green space, and it involves quite a big multidisciplinary team, including a number of excellent Kerr people. Um, and it's about urban greening. I'm an urban planner and that's my fascination, but it's also about scale because, you know, I've been in the literature a bit and seen the kinds of things we talk about in urban greening. And one of the things that we talk about less than I'd expected is scale because the scale of challenges that we face in our cities and indeed our settlements is really becoming quite apparent as the weather gets crazier and crazier. So um, I'm going to show you some of my research findings today, but first let's just get a sense of the scale of the challenges that um, this research grapples with and engages with. So uh, City of Melbourne is a lovely place to deal with challenges involving climate change and overgreening. They declared a climate emergency well before the pandemic, um, a climate and biodiversity emergency indeed. And even at that time, they had a really good suite of strategies. You know, they've got an urban forest strategy, a flood management strategy, a climate adaptation strategy, a biodiversity strategy. Um, and what, what I found was all of these plants say the right things. They've got good targets and goals and aspirations, and, and they're all calling for the same stuff, which is space to put trees and green space in cities. So, and that's often the challenge, and that's the pinch point. So you know, both here in Melbourne, but also when I work in Europe, those cities as well really struggle to find space to actually meet all of these strategic targets to use nature as a response to climate change and other challenges. So let's talk about the scale of some of these challenges and, and how much change is actually required. This is the Elizabeth Street catchment where RMIT's Melbourne office sits. Um, you can see the hodl grid over there. And it's a flood exposed area. In fact, Melbourne water ranks it as an area of extreme flood risk. And that's partly because it's 83% sealed. So most of it is buildings, concrete and asphalt. And that means, uh, you know, our engineered drainage systems really can be overwhelmed very easily when we get heavy rainfall events. It doesn't help, as you can see in those purple lines, so we've got historic watercourses running through the centre of the city. Um, so the city's got a strategy on what to do about this. They've got a 2030 target of depaving. They want to take out a whole lot of asphalt and concrete um, so that there's actually a bit of open soil to soak up water so that when it storms heavily, we, we don't get heavy flooding. And you can see in that red box, the number 655,000, that's square meters. Now that equates to 65 hectares. 65 hectares in a catchment, that's only 308 hectares, so quite a small urban catchment. And to get a sense of how big that is, let's look at Flagstaff Gardens. That's Flagstaff there. That's um, one of the biggest parks in the inner city area. 
that's 7.2 hectares. So 65 hectares is nine new Flagstaff Gardens worth of green space by 2030. That's a huge challenge for, for such an urbanized area. So these canopy targets as well, a similar issue. So um, they've got a 40% canopy cover target for 2040 in the city of Melbourne. Current covers about 23%. So we're talking about, you know, an extra 17% canopy cover, uh, which equates when you crunch the numbers to 182 hectares of new canopy cover. So if we go back to our little Flagstaff Gardens analogy, that's 25 new Flagstaff Gardens worth of green cover for the city. Now, you may feel like you're watching Sesame Street at this point, um, and maybe I have laboured the point a bit, but really it, it just emphasises how much new space we need. It, it's, it's great to talk about urban greening, it's great to have demonstration projects, but we actually just need heaps and heaps of new green space in our city for us to handle some of the challenges ahead of us. So with that in mind, hovering over me like a ghost at all times, um, I walk around and think about the city and then I come across something like this, the transport strategy for 2030. Uh, this was really interesting. It came together a few years ago now and it had this tantalizing fact in it, um, which I believe was actually put together by one of my co-authors um, on this paper, Elizabeth Taylor. So there are 460 hectares of car parking in the city of Melbourne. That's 3.6 hodl grids worth of car parking right here in the city. So that's one area where very contested land has actually been allocated quite generously. Quickly on how it breaks down, you can see there's two little bars there. That's our on-street parking in the city. Um, so about 23,000 spaces and then a whole lot of off-street car parking space as well residential, commercial and other private spaces. Commercial means the car parks where you pay and you go into one of these multi-deck car parks and the other private parking is often office car parking. So heaps of office car parking in the centre city. But even just our on-street parking allocation, even though it's dwarfed by the off-street parking, amounts to a really large area of land. It's 50 hectares of very high value land that could be green space in our central city areas. And that's important and exciting because it seems like there's a fair bit of redundancy in the other car parking types. So um, before the pandemic, uh, the vacancy rate inside residential apartments uh, car parking in Melbourne was between 26 and 41 percent. So lots of people who either don't have cars, don't need cars or aren't using their car parking spaces. And we don't know what the vacancy rates in these other categories are, particularly in the wake of COVID with hybrid work, but it's reasonable to expect that quite a lot of those will be vacant. And even if it's just a little bit of these spaces that are vacant, um, with 140,000 spaces, even if just 10 or 20% of those are vacant, that's the same amount as almost all the on-street parking in the city. So the big idea of this paper, which we're going to explore now, is what if we take quite a bit of parking off the city streets and put it into the vacant space that's waiting in those buildings. What can we get in terms of urban greening to meet some of those really huge challenging spatial targets that we discussed just before? So I've boiled down to three research questions. Um, firstly, how much space is redundantly allocated to street parking? So when I say redundant, that's when you've got a street park that's sitting right next to a building with car parking that could absorb it. Secondly, where are these redundant spaces? So um, we actually mapped it out. It's a spatial study. And then third, what ecosystem services do we get if we convert these spaces to green space? So we did a whole bunch of modeling. Um, so this is what it looked like for that very first step, mapping out um, which car parking spaces, so those the green dots and red dots, which car parking spaces could be absorbed by adjacent buildings that have the vacancy inside them. Did this with a thing called location allocation analysis. And it spits out these lovely maps um, which show where the car parking spaces are at the municipal scale that we could use. As you can see, that says scenario 12. That is because we used a scenario approach to uh, navigate some of the uncertainty that's inherent when you don't know how much free space is available in buildings in the wake of the pandemic. So we used a few scenarios. Um, this term max distance was just how far a streetcar park was moved into a building. So it was either a maximum distance of 100 or 200 meters. 
So that immediately created two sets of scenarios. And then we just ran three of, uh, you know, three subsets. So what if we just use commercial car parks that are already set up? And we assume quite high vacancy rates in those car parks because they're already set up for that. The other set of scenarios looked at if we just use private garages, so, you know, apartment car parking and offices, and we assume much lower rates of vacancy in those cases. And then thirdly, we used a combination approach where we're using all the car parking in different kinds of buildings um, at the vacancy rates in A and B. So that gives us 12 scenarios, which creates just a sense of the spectrum of possibilities we could have if we can start consolidating car parking into buildings. So um, here's what we got uh, in, in, in raw numbers. So the darker bars are for moving car parks 200 meters, the lighter bars are for moving car parks 100 meters, and each of those sets corresponds to a set of assumptions. So our lowest results were for commercial car parks where we used up to 30% of their capacity. And we see about 6,000 car parking spaces if we're moving car parking spaces off the street. Once you go to the bottom sets of bars, you can see, you know, ballpark 10 to 12,000 spaces could be consolidated off our streets into buildings. And as you can imagine, that translates into quite a lot of new land. So um, between 12.9 and 24 and a half hectares of space of asphalt that we could be pulling out of the city if we're able to achieve these higher scenarios. Um, so that's the, you know, the quantum of it. But now that we know how much, you know, the scale of the opportunity um, and where the opportunities are, we went modeling to see what, what to do with the space. So first to do our modeling, we needed a, a, a design to model. So we knew what we were putting in, right? And then we actually went on to the modeling. So I'll show you the design. I'll show you those model results now. Um, to give a sense of what the design looks like though, here's a real project from Sheffield. Um, and it's got three elements that are the essential elements of what we modeled. You can see the street trees there. You can also see really nice flowers. That's the understory planting that we specified to support biodiversity because biodiversity is part of the study. And then lastly, you probably can't see this, but it's actually a sunken design. So it's a swale that takes stormwater. So that's where you've got your water sensitive urban design element of that as well. And I was very pleased to work with uh, Casey Vissenton, one of our um, specialists inside the Icon Science Group. Um, and he helped you know, translate this into a design that is the size of one car, banks, car parking space, but could be replicated across the city. And we did a whole, you know, set for slight variations in the car parking in the city. You know, you've got commercial areas of the city where you might want more dining. You've got median car parks, which maybe don't work as well uh, to capture stormwater. But either way, we, we, we sort of had a set of designs that we could base the modeling on. And then we took that through all the kind of pragmatic concerns that you need to think about when you are reallocating city space to green space. And this just gave us confidence that we were actually replicating something that was plausible in urban areas. So let's go to our results. I worked with Dr. Alexandra Osola to look at modeling tree canopy. And here's what one of our model outputs looks like. What you see in the pink is new tree canopy cover under one of our scenarios. So these are sites where there wasn't a tree canopy already. So we didn't model a tree if there's already a tree there. So only in car parking spaces that we could reclaim that didn't have a tree over them already, we modeled a tree being there and we modeled the canopy growth. And certainly some streets really go from being almost barren to having really quite good tree canopy under our scenarios. The total tree canopy provided um, is quite substantial. So at maturity, these trees would provide an extra 30 to 60 hectares of tree canopy cover, um, quite a substantial amount. And because we were working with real tree canopy growth data as our basis, we could actually estimate as the trees grow, how much canopy we get in each scenario. So you can see the light bars are quite small. They're all under about 10 hectares of canopy. That's when the trees are new. Middle bars are as they're maturing, that sort of 10 to 20 year old group. And the biggest bars, that's your 95th percentile trees. Um, that's, you know, where you get really big, healthy tree canopy cover. Um, 
and you can see for our scenarios we yeah we get up to about 60 hectares but it's definitely in that 30 to 60 hectare range for most scenarios it's a lot of tree canopy um, we're also really interested in how creating a whole lot of new green spaces through the landscape links up that landscape for local native uh, insects and birds so we modeled the blue banded bees habitat and the New Holland honey eaters habitat as they um, were connected in the city through these tr new treatments. And we saw, well, here's OK, this this might actually help you understand a bit more what we did in terms of modeling. So I worked with Dr. Holly Kirk on this. She's also in our lab um, and these maps that she produced give a sense. So we can see on the left we've got different colors of all the city's parks. Those different colours mean habitats that the blue banded bee cannot move between. So if they're different colours, they're essentially isolated because bees struggle to move long distances across roads in particular. Um, once you put in all these parking spaces in our scenarios, you start seeing that those habitats link up. And we found that was because the bee was able to use them as stepping stones between larger green spaces. So a great result for the bee. Um, here's how the data kind of came out. So on the right, you've got the, the bird, um, and on the left, you've got the, the blue banded bee. For the bird, it's a pretty linear relationship. Take more parking, get more bird habitat, right? Or make more connected bird habitat. But for the bee, it was quite interesting because we had some scenarios where there was almost no increase in connectivity, and somewhere where there were really big increases in connectivity, up to 60 hectares of new uh, connected habitat, right? And that was simply because in some scenarios we moved the car parks just 100 meters and that didn't spread these stepping stones enough to create um, connected habitat, whereas in the 200 meter scenarios that did work. So really interesting in, uh, result for insect connectivity. Lastly, let's talk about water. So here we worked with Dr. Casey Furlong um, and we figured out a, rule, a set of rules around how many of these car parking spaces could actually become rain gardens and start functioning in stormwater treatment. And then we fed them into a pretty standard software called Music, which tells us, you know, stormwater treatment outcomes. So I'll show you the results from one of those scenarios. So in a scenario where we're taking up to 20% of private and residential parking in buildings, um, we're moving the car parks 200 meters off the street into these buildings. We intercept 78 million litres of stormwater annually. We also capture 23 tonnes of litter. <clears throat> we prevent 176 tonnes of sediment going into Port Phillip Bay, as you can see it happening here. And algal blooms are pretty unpleasant. Uh, taking nutrient pollutants out is quite important to avoid that. So our interventions stop a ton of nitrogen and 256 kilos of phosphorus. Now, all of those numbers are probably completely meaningless in the context of a city. You don't know if they're big or not. I don't either. So I went and dug up some policy targets and tried to give that a frame of reference. So I ended up looking at a number of policy targets, and this is how I'm going to wrap up the presentation, um, and just getting a sense of how well our scenarios do relative to the city's policy targets. So you can see in the green, look at, looking at the city's canopy cover target, they need quite a lot of new canopy cover. The percentage that you see there is how much just the parking interventions would deliver on the target. So you see 33%. So 33% of their total target would be delivered by just these parking interventions. So the bars that you see, the light bars are our lowest scenario. The darkest bars is the highest scenario result. And then we had one scenario, which in particular we thought was probably the easiest to implement. And that we can see delivers a decent canopy result. So 27% of the city's canopy target could be delivered by taking car parking out of the center of the city. Uh, Depaving that Elizabeth Street catchment target, uh, was slightly less impressive result, but useful. So we could deliver 10% of the uh, target that's desired there. In terms of sediment, uh, we do really, really well, as well as phosphorus. So just these interventions could deliver the city's targets for sediment and phosphorus. Pretty strong result there for nitrogen as well, and not bad on litter. So all in all, quite a substantial set of impacts on policy targets. But also quite striking that even with thousands of car parking spaces being pulled out of the city, 
um, and convert it to green space, that's only part of the job. So the scale of change, I really hope this is driven home, that we have ahead of us is, is really huge. And these are the kind of steps that we need to take. So in summary, thousands of parking spaces in the city are probably redundant. Parking could be green space. Converting it to green space will get us towards our sustainability targets. And uh, this is an example of how we need to get good at systemic land use change. That's it for me. Um, please drop me an email if you don't feel like you want to ask a question now. And in closing, I'll also just say I'm towards the end of my PhD. So if you are thinking about research collaborations, postdocs, pursuing grants, I'd love to collaborate with you. Please get in touch. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Tommy. That was a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, do we have any questions? There's a lot of chatter going on uh, in the chat box. Um, are there any questions? And Lauren, did, did Tommy answer your question on, I was moving through a casino at the moment and I lost some of my cover, some of my online uh, reception. So uh, if you could repeat that question for Tommy, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Matt. I hope you're winning at the casino there. Um, <laughs> Tommy, I was asking about um, RMIT's car parking. Um, you know, there's interest in turning some of RMIT's uh, actions into research questions. And I'm wondering whether uh, the car parking around RMIT has been measured and whether you've looked at some of those conversions you're talking about from street parking, such as Cardigan Street, into the commercial car park there, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had a specific look at RMIT, Lauren, but I, I can see that in the city centre, that's when you've got the biggest aggregations of redundant parking. Um, it's especially centralised around there. So I'd, I'd be pretty optimistic that um, a lot of those car parks are in fact redundant and could be consolidated. Yeah, terrific. And then there's the Bandura question as well, which um, there must be just like hectares of car parking out there that could be better utilised. But still, it depends on the public transport options. Mm. That's it, exactly. Yeah. Over to Jago. Jago, you had a question, huh? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Tommy. Look, really terrific presentation and um, great to see your work. Um, just one question. Is there a tension potentially between the objectives around um, increasing the number of bike lanes and um, pedestrian spaces, which all tend to be paved with, um, you know, the con potentially contesting the resource that becomes available um, for eco restoration in the form of the parking spaces because often they're the same they're the same piece of road and should we oh, there's a bit of a leading question now um should we be in turn thinking about actually closing off entire road sections rather than just taking away the parking okay so two bits to that question um i i do think about this a lot when i'm walking around jago and i i've, I've noticed that often you've got car parking, then a bike lane, then a road lane. So in those cases, it's not too much of a conflict, but definitely lately in the CBD with car parking being pulled out and being turned into bike lanes. Um, yeah, I, I, that is a conflict and they are competing uses in those instances. Whether we could put a pretty narrow planting area that creates soil volume underneath the bike lane to still have canopy over those uh, lanes. I, I, I think there might still be win-wins, but there's certainly a contest there. And as for your other question, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, if we've got streets that we can close that we just don't need, then we don't have to do all the squeezing. I'd, I'd love to start looking at how we decide when a street just doesn't need to be work hard at all. Probably, probably just a comment maybe going to um, Lauren's point or the point that Lauren and I were discussing about um, access for light commercial vehicles. I think if we could solve that, that's probably the last point of resistance um, in the whole car space um, reclamation kind of debate. Um, so that's possibly something to think about. How to integrate um, last mile freight delivery with um, 